أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاوت لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا I seek refuge in Allah from the cursed shaitan. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. The messenger has believed in what was revealed to him from his Lord, and so have the believers. All of them have believed in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers, saying, We make no distinction between any of his messengers. And they say, We hear and we obey. We seek your forgiveness, our Lord, and to you is the final destination. Allah does not charge a soul except with that within its capacity. It will have the consequence of what good it has gained, and it will bear the consequence of what evil it has earned. Our Lord, do not impose blame upon us if we have forgotten or erred. Our Lord, and lay not upon us a burden like that which you have laid upon those before us. Our Lord, and burden us not with that which we have no ability to bear, and pardon us, and forgive us, and have mercy upon us. You are our protector, so give us victory over the disbelieving people. On behalf of the Islamic Propagation Association, as well as all of the various organizations and associations that have contributed toward bringing this event together, we would like to extend really a warm welcome to every one of you, both non-Muslim and Muslims to this event tonight. Before we get into the discussion of this interesting topic, discovering our life's purpose, we'd like to begin by first giving you a little bit of background information regarding the person who will be speaking specifically about this topic, our brother, Sheikh Khalid Yassin. So some information about the Sheikh. Sheikh Khalid Yassin was born in New York City, USA as a Christian where he spent most of his childhood. The Sheikh embraced Islam in the year 1965 with the late Sheikh Dawood Ahmed Faisal of the Islamic Mission of America, located in Brooklyn, New York. The Sheikh has studied over the course of 40 years fiqh sunnah or Islamic jurisprudence, aqidah, which is his Islamic creed or theology, memorization of the Quran, Islamic history and the Arabic language with several well-known teachers and mentors. His main teacher is Sheikh Khalid Al-Halwani of Mecca Mukarrama, who is a student of Sheikh Safar Al-Hawali, who is one of the leading scholars in the world today. The Sheikh has dedicated the last 40 years removing misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. He has delivered lectures in more than 75 countries worldwide, resulting in over 70,000 persons embracing Islam directly from his hands by the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these figures have been corroborated through many, through many sources. There are thousands of people around the world who have embraced Islam after listening to, his, or to one of his over 100 recorded lectures. There are hundreds of students in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, Australia, Europe, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States who have completed Dawah techniques, Dawah management, and Islam 101 courses, three of the most powerful 
and effective courses offered by the Purpose of Life Foundation, of which the Sheikh is the CEO. The Sheikh has dedicated himself to over, in the past 30 years, to advising young Muslims, especially those who are minorities living in Western societies towards citizenship and social responsibility. He has been constantly working towards the revival of Islam in the world and the uplifting of the consciousness of Muslims. The Sheikh is also the founder and CEO of the following registered organizations, the Islamic Television Trust located in the United Kingdom, the Purpose of Life Foundation, the Islamic Information Network, Purpose Television, and the Islamic and America Foundations all located here in the United States. So with that in mind, I begin by first reminding myself and afterwards to all of you to pay attention and to focus our attention on this interesting topic, discovering our life's purpose as we listen to our brother, Sheikh Khalid Yassin. إن الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه وعزواجه ومن ولا وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أيها الأخوة الكرام وأخوات السيدات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, To our respected uh, non-Muslim guests faculty members administration homeland security We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity to visit San Diego. I think it's been at least, um, for me, 12 years since I had the chance to visit San Diego, so this is a refreshing opportunity. I think it's only fair to uh, give you a little background on this, um, on this lecture. Uh, this lecture was conceived uh, in 1994. Uh, it was conceived because I found myself faced with presenting Islam to people who were sort of professional, pragmatic, materialistic, um, intellectual, and the normal presentation that most Muslims uh, use, uh, at least at that time, was sort of following the Sheikh Ahmed Didat style. Ghafrullah Allah, may Allah have mercy upon him. And also I found, even from some of my own personal teachers, um, that, you know, we begin by talking about the pillars of Islam, the, um, the Islamic points, principles of belief, and so we would go down this path of discussing doctrine and the Islamic belief system uh, as a religious pro proposition. <clears throat> well, the first um, opportunity that I had to present this lecture, I realized uh, at that time I was in Jidda, Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> and the um, the audience primarily, um, these were Europeans, European professionals who were living and working in Saudi Arabia. They were from Scandinavia, Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, United States, Canada, France. <clears throat> and they were in Saudi Arabia not to listen to religion. They were in Saudi Arabia to make money. So when I came to the uh, place to talk with them, um, I could see by their demeanor that they had already been sort of saturated with the religious doctrines. If you live in Saudi Arabia or work in Saudi Arabia, um, as a, as a non-Muslim, 
um, they'll give you books. Um, the brothers who are standing, are, are there some available chairs here? If you can have a seat, it'd be much better, if you can. Uh, and some of the sisters, I think, are also standing. Do we have chairs for the sisters? I mean, these are our sisters. I don't see why our sisters should be standing. So some of our brothers, they should get up out of them chairs and give our sisters seats. Now, normally, I understand, <clears throat> sisters and brothers, I understand that normally, you know, you, we got this uh, idea of separating you know, but this is a university, this is not a mosque. And this is America. So, you know, I think our sisters, they know how to sit, where to sit, and it, you know, no sisters are gonna be sitting in no brother's lap, so you don't have to worry about that. So let the sisters, let the sisters get a seat. The sisters are standing in the back there, um, to be very frank with you, um, I cannot deliver this lecture in less than an hour. So whoever's going to be standing, you're going to be a bit uncomfortable. So I'm just trying to straighten that issue out before we start. Now, <clears throat> so uh, I, when I entered the room, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Fred. I mean, I didn't know that was his name then. But when I entered the room, uh, his demeanor was a bit unprofessional, and he says to me, um, how you doing, man? Give me five. So, I think, you know, they had, some of the Saudi brothers had told him that the guy who was going to talk to them, you know, was from Brooklyn. So he had his whole thing together to kind of talk some jive to me. So I told him, listen, um, I don't know who you think I am and I don't know what you think I'm going to talk about. But I didn't come to talk jive. I didn't come to slap hands and give you five. I came to talk about a very important subject. And, thank you very much, brother. And since you guys work in Saudi Arabia and you make on an average of $250 a day, I think what you need to do is you need to readjust yourself with some seriousness, and sit back and listen to this lecture because you're getting paid for this lecture. And if you're smart, you'll sit back and if you want to, you can go to sleep, it doesn't matter to me, and get paid. But if you're not so smart, you should go back to work and earn your living. So what do you think he decided to do? He decided to sit back and listen to the lecture. <clears throat> so, um, I decided to sort of change the presentation and to talk about life, values, principles, ethics, objectives. To present Islam, but to first begin by talking about the purpose of life. Because I knew these were all professionals. People who were system analysts. People who were micromanagers. People who were intellectuals. People who were engineers. So they would certainly appreciate coming from that perspective. Well, we have delivered um, this lecture, The Purpose of Life, uh, all over the world. And as a matter of fact, um, I'm very sorry to be late, but uh, I just fly from Nigeria to Dubai, and from Dubai uh, to Los Angeles, and from Los Angeles to San Diego. 
So you know the homeboys, they meet me. You, you know the homeboys. Homeland Security. So you know, they, they meet me, this is my official welcoming committee. So they meet me in Los Angeles and they, they go through their um, ritual. And um, so because of that, um, they caused me to miss my plane. And, and it's okay, I understand, that, I understand the, uh, the time that we're living in. And I understand the, um, the, um, the paranoia that my country lives under. And so I try to, as a professional, just absorb um, and take all of that into consideration. And often they cause me to miss a connection flight and they don't reimburse me. They just say that shit, this is our, this is a system we have to go through and excuse us. Um, and so I had to catch the next flight. So I'm not making an excuse, but it's our country. That's the time that we live in. So uh, I've delivered this lecture um, probably now in about at least 34 countries. And over the last 20 years, we've had fairly phenomenal um, results from this lecture. I'd like to begin by saying that this is, um, this is really a public presentation. And I think the best way for you to receive it is to receive it like it's a certificate presentation, like a seminar. And if each one of you were if each one of you had paid like $250 for this seminar because it was supposed to be like life changing or it's supposed to be in motivational and you were going to get a certificate for this, then you would be listening carefully and that's what I would like you to do. And we're in a the right setting. Um, the university is certainly the right setting to give this kind of a presentation because it's a neutral setting. We have faculty and we have administration and we have students and we have people from the general community here. <clears throat> Therefore, Having said that, please turn your glasses right side up. That's the glass of your heart and the glass of your mind. Because if your glass is subjective, prejudicial, closed-minded, preconceptual, then your glass is upside down. And no matter what you pour on it, you're never going to get a full glass. Now it's not our responsibility and it's not our intention to use lectures to convert people. And Muslims who do that, I think they're just a bit immature because that's not the intent of Islam. Uh, our responsibility is to plant the seed, not to cause things to grow. Our responsibility is to deliver the message and not to be responsible for what people get from the message. You know, like the mailman. The mailman delivers bills and thrills. The mailman brings good news and bad news, but you can't shoot the mailman. You can't blame the mailman. And when you get a check in the mail, you don't share the money with the mailman. So we are just delivering the message. That's our job. But if you have an open heart and an open mind, then there's a very good chance 
that you will receive what is intended. Dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam and dear respected brothers and sisters in humanity, as my brother mentioned to you, I'm here tonight and I'm very honored to have this opportunity to address you on this topic because I see myself sitting in some of the chairs in front of me just a few days ago, a few years ago. Just a little while I was sitting right there where you are perhaps a Christian, a non-Muslim or what, of whatever nationality. It doesn't really matter, just a human being that at that time wasn't aware of Islam and at that particular time, I personally didn't know what the purpose of life was. I hadn't thought about it. So with that note, I would request you to think of what I'm saying to you as information and advice. This information I wish to share with you, it may seem a bit extensive, but when you consider the capacity of the human brain and the amount of information that it can store, and how it is able to decipher, then a few pages of information tonight will not overburden you. And since we're living in the Google age and the, the facade book age, excuse me, Facebook, <laughs> since we're living in the Google age and the Facebook age and the Twitter age and the YouTube age, and most of the young people today spend two, three, four hours a day surfing the web, sitting in chat rooms, Twittering, YouTubing, whatever. So, a bit of information that we're going to share here tonight shouldn't be that overbearing. And every now and then, I'll try to say something that will give you a little bit of edutainment. I didn't bring my white gloves and I'm going to do a... Uh, what was that Michael Jackson did, the moonwalk? I won't do that because it's not entertainment. But I'll do my best to keep it, as the young people say, I'll try to keep it live. It is my responsibility to transfer some information to you on the topic, what is the purpose of our life? I begin by quoting to you a verse of the Qur'an and I won't, I won't translate each one of the ayats that I'm going to give because it will take up time unnecessarily, but this particular ayah I think is necessary to translate it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned in the Qur'an, أَوْزُ بِاللَّهِ اسْمِ الْعَلِيمِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٌ لِأُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ الَّذِينَ يَذْقُرُونَ اللَّهَ كِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ uh, this uh, verse is in the surah which is called Al-Imran uh, and it says, Behold, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alternation of the night and the day, there are indeed signs for men of understanding. Men and women who celebrate the praises of Allah standing, sitting and lying down on their sides as they contemplate the wonders of the creation of the heavens and the earth with the thought, our Lord, not for any foolish or vain purpose have you created all of this. Glory be to you. Give us salvation from the penalty of the hellfire. As I mentioned, I'm very honored to have this opportunity and I would like to begin by saying that all of you have an equal responsibility and that responsibility is to listen with an open heart an open mind. In a world filled with prejudice and cultural conditioning, 
it is very hard to find people that are able to take a moment to think and to reflect about life objectively and to try and arrive at the truth about this world and the real purpose of our lives. Unfortunately, when you ask most people the question, what is the purpose of our life, which is such an important and fundamental question, they're not able to tell you what they have really concluded from observation or analytical reasoning. In most cases, they will simply tell you what someone else said, or they will tell you what is commonly presumed by others. Some will say what their father or their mother said the purpose of life is, or what the minister of their church said that the purpose of life is, or they will say what their teacher in school said, or what their friend said. Now, if I ask anyone about the purpose of eating, that is, why do we eat? Everybody will say, in one way or another, we eat because it provides us with nutrition, and nutrition sustains life. Everybody will say that. If I ask anyone why they work, they will say, because it's a necessity in order to support myself and to provide needs for my family. If I ask anybody why they sleep, or why they wash, or why they dress, etc., they will answer that these are common necessities for every human being. And we can follow this simple line of questioning with a hundred questions and receive the same or similar answers from anyone in any language in any place in the world. And I have done so. Then I ask you, why is it that when we ask the question, what is the goal, the objective, or the purpose of life, why do we get so many answers, so many different, why do we get so many different answers? We get philosophical answers, we get rhetorical answers, or people just say, I don't know. Or we have subjective answers, which is people just answer with anything because they don't want to really admit they haven't thought about it. It is because people are confused. They don't really know. They are conjecturing. And they are stumbling in the dark. And rather than admit, I don't know, they just offer any answer that they may have been programmed to answer. Well, think about it tonight and we will give a clear proposition about this subject. First, we need to ask the question, is our purpose in this world simply to eat, sleep, dress, work, acquire some material things, enjoy ourselves, and then die? Is this our purpose in life? It cannot be. So, the Quran just mentioned to us in the Fihalqis Mawaji wal Aldi Bakhtilaf Lady Wan Naha. Verily, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, in the alternation of the night and the day, this is something powerful for the human being to think about. Just this small part of the ayah. In the Fihalqis Mawaji wal Ard, Wahtilaf Lady Wan Naha. The ayatun li ul al albab. So Almighty God, you know the ayah, the way it's constructed. You know a human being couldn't say that. A human being couldn't say, verily in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day. A human being could not have written that because it's written in a, in a grammatical way that someone outside of the creation is saying it. Someone outside of the scope of creation is speaking. And human beings, as long as we have lived on the earth, we're still discovering. Is that correct? Is that correct? So if we're still discovering, that means that we're inside the creation. We're still discovering. We don't even know all the micro and macro dynamics of creation. 
So it could not be human beings. It has to be someone else. Then it says, and in the alternation of the day and the night, and you know, human beings just discovered the alternation of the day and the night, just discovered this year a few thousand years ago. We know from forensic evidence that the earth has cooled down and developed its ecosystems at least 76 million years ago. So if the earth cooled down and developed and manifested its ecosystems just 76 million years ago, then it could not have been a human being constructing that either. الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا Those who reflect upon the creation while they are standing, sitting, lying down on their sides. And subhanAllah, the way this ayah is also constructed is powerful because it is giving three different psychological postures of the human being. See, when a human being is standing, delivering, speaking, they're in their most powerful conscious state, delivering a lecture, or standing in front of a judge, or making a statement, or teaching, and sitting another psychological state, which is less profound, sitting, researching, listening, receiving as you are, or they are lying down on their sides, which is the most subjective state of the human being. Because lying down on your side, you could be asleep, you could be sick, or you could be nearly dead. And in all of these different states, the human being is reflecting about this creation. And those who have knowledge, prophetic knowledge, based upon divine revelation, their conclusion is, oh my Lord, oh God, certainly you could not have created all of this for any foolish purpose. Therefore, inspire us and save us from the chastisement of the grave. Here's another verse from the Quran. This comes in a surah which is called a nahad it is, it is named after the bee because in the ayah, Allah gives some insight. Almighty God gives insight into the, the wonders and the phenomena of the bee and what the bee does and how they live in their colonies and how they follow their own signs, their inner instincts in building and developing roads and buildings. And then after that, they are producing something very vital for the human beings called honey. So the, the verse says, to Allah belongs the mystery of the heavens and the earth. And the decision of the hour of judgment of human beings is as the twinkling of an eye, or even quicker. For Almighty God has power over all things. It is he who brought you forth from the wombs of your mothers when you knew nothing. And he gave you hearing and sight and intelligence and reflection that you may give thanks. Do you not look at the birds? The Quran says, do you not look at the birds, whether they are just the birds that we see or the birds that the human beings have created, the planes? Do you not look at the birds, how they are poised in the sky? And if it's not for the mercy of God, if it's not for the wisdom of God, which he gave some to the human beings, they would fall down on the earth. They could not stay in the, up in the sky. Verily, this is another sign for the people who reflect. So some people may argue that life doesn't have any definite purpose and that there's nothing that can be proven through logic, science, 
or conclusive reasoning that there is a God, a divine purpose, or any normal reasoning behind this world. Excuse me, Mr. Darwin. Now here in these verses, Almighty God has mentioned very clearly to us by first drawing our attention to the creation of ourselves, the different postures of the human body and the human psychology, the different attitudes of the human psychology. He draws our attention to the heavens, to the alternation of the night and the day, to the firmament, the stars, the constellations. Then he says to us that he has not created all of this for any vain or empty purpose because God doesn't shoot dice. God doesn't have to have a mathematical equation to know what is the measurement of things. God doesn't make mistakes and God doesn't come forth with theories and God doesn't produce rhetoric Rhetoric and projections and equations is how human beings express themselves in order to arrive at what they consider to be what is accurate or the truth. When you see the design of the heavens and the earth and you reflect upon it, you know that it is very powerful and very precise which is beyond your own calculation and imagination. It cannot be vain, it cannot be empty, it cannot be just thrown together. For instance, if you took 10 marbles and numbered them one to 10, you know, different colored marbles, and you numbered them one to 10, and you put them inside of a bag, shook the bag or put it in a box and shake it, then without looking inside, see if you can reach inside that box and bring out marble number one, marble number two, marble number three, all the way to marble number ten. What's the chance of doing that without looking inside the box? So some of you PhDDD sitting here tonight, give me the equation. Because um, what's the young man, well he's not young anymore, What's the, what's the, he's a, he's a quadriplegic. He's the top, Stephen Hawkins. This, this is a, this is a, this is a projection that uh, Mr. Stephen Hawkins, who is a quadriplegic, who is the, one of the top physicists of the world today. This is a formula that he came out with. He said, if you put 10 marbles in a box or a bag and shook them up and numbered them, if you didn't look inside, what's the chances of bringing out marble one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in that row? Is anybody here who's a mathematical genius can tell us? The answer is 26 million to one. So if it's 26 million to one just to bring out ten marbles, What's the chance of this heavens and earth that we know about? Because we only know about our solar system. We know about our sun and the planets that are going around our sun. That's called our solar system. But now we know that our sun is only one of the smaller stars in the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is a galaxy, a smaller galaxy among larger clusters of galaxies. And we know that there are literally millions of galaxies. So that means human beings haven't really went anywhere. When we think about man landing on the moon, that's like going next door. That's like going next door. So what's the chance of this heavens and earth just being thrown together? You know, like somebody just said something and it's just thrown together and it stays as it is, moving as it is, 
not in a static position, but everything is moving and floating and swimming according to a law that can be determined. Because the speed of light means the time that it takes to reach something and bounce back. That's the speed of light. That's how we are able to determine the speed of light. How far it takes light to reach a solid object and bounce back. That's how we can tell what the distance of that object is. Moving at 186,000 miles per second. So there are nine planets in our solar system. They eliminated two. About 10 years ago, they eliminated two of the planets and said that they're not really in our solar system. But let's just take the nine that's swimming around the sun and take our sun, which is swimming itself around another cluster of stars. What's the chances of all of that being put together by chance? It's not possible. So we ask, how could the heavens and the earth be just thrown together randomly? That's the same as somebody saying that we brought a B-52 bomber and dropped it on a, 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 a mile, a, a junkyard, one mile by one mile. Just imagine a junkyard that large. One mile wide, one mile long, a junkyard. And we brought a B-52 bomber over that and dropped bombs on the junkyard and, uh, uh, and then it turned all that junk into BMWs. <laughs> it's like order comes from chaos. Is that possible? It's not possible. Excuse me, Mr. Darwin. <laughs> My dear respected brothers and sisters, you have to ask yourself a further question. When you see a bridge, a building, or an automobile, you automatically consider the person or the company that designed it and that constructed it. When you see an airplane, a rocket ship, a satellite, or a large ship, you also think about the in how incredible of a vehicle that it is. When you see a nuclear plant or an orbiting space station, a super international airport, you have to be thoroughly impressed with the engineering dynamics that are involved. Yet, these are just things that are manufactured by the human beings. Things that are manufactured by the human mind. Then what about the human body with this massive and intricate control systems that we ourselves did not construct. And we ourselves, we are not able to control. And we ourselves, we're still studying the phenomena of the human body. What about that? Think about the brain, how it thinks, how it functions, how it analyzes, how it stores information, retrieves that information, distinguishes and categorizes that information in a millionth of a second and does it constantly Think about the brain for a moment. Almighty God said in the Quran, it is he who created you from dust and then from a sperm drop and then from a leech-like clot inside clinging to the womb. Then you get out into the light as a child. Then he lets you grow and reach your age of full strength and you become old and arrogant. Though and some of you, he causes you to die even before you become old. And then he lets you reach a term appointed in order that you may learn wisdom. This is Surah Ghafir. This is the same brain that made the automobile, the rocket ships, the nuclear submarines, and so on. Think about the capacity of the human brain for a moment. The human mind has made scientific discoveries and technologies such as the human DNA, quantum physics, 
forensic medicine, molecular biology, mathematical equations that have made informational search engines possible. The human brain, which has made it possible to translate and document things in over 162 languages. Can you think about the brain for a moment? You can go to Google today, and the brain may Google, gaggle or giggle. Today, you can go to Google and take a document in 161 languages and translate it just like that. Just like that. The human brain did that. So, think about the human brain for a moment. The human mind is now able to make surgery upon itself and to perform microsurgery upon the brain and the heart. Think about the heart for a moment. How it pumps continuously for 60 to 90 years, intaking and discharging blood throughout the body and maintaining that steady precision throughout the life of that person. And the thing about the heart and the brain is that they are functioning even without the human being even monitoring what's going on. Your brain is still functioning when you are asleep. Your heart is pumping without you even thinking about it. Now think about the kidneys and the lungs and the kind of function that they perform. The purifying instruments of the body which perform hundreds of ch chemical analyses simultaneously and also controlling the level of toxicity throughout the content of the body. And it does all of this automatically and consistently. Think about your eyes, the human camera that adjusts focus, interrupts, evaluates, applies color automatically, the natural reception and adjustment to light and distance automatically. Think about who it is that created that. Who mastered that? Is it human beings? Are human beings responsible for their own existence? Are human beings responsible for their own design? No. Of course not. Then what about the universe? Think about this. The Earth is one planet in our solar system, and our solar system is one of the systems in the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is one of the constellations in that galaxy. And there are millions of galaxies like the Milky Way. And the, and the millions of galaxies, millions of galaxies form what is called, a cluster of galaxies is called a nebula. So we went from, we went from a, a star to a cluster of stars, like we call it our solar system. Then we take those cluster of stars that make up something like a galaxy, which is like the galaxy that we're in is called the Milky Way galaxy. And then there are millions of galaxies that form another cluster called nebula. Then they, then they have other clusters of nebula that themselves, they give it another name. Yet they're all in order. There are millions of galaxies like the Milky Way, and they are all in order, and they are all precise. So, we are born. And what is the object of our existence? And what is the wisdom behind the creation of man and this tremendous universe? Think about that question. Some person may argue that there's no proof of any divine origin. And there's no real proof that this universe has come about through any divine purpose. And those people who argue like that, they have the right to argue, and they have the, this is what human beings can do. Human beings start out 
like a drop of sperm. That's it. Everybody sitting out here is nothing but a sophisticated sperm drop. That's all. I don't care how you dress, what your name is, where you live, what your titles are, you're just a sophisticated sperm drop. And after a certain amount of time, you know, you start getting these titles and intellectual background and all of a sudden you become arrogant and you don't have to recognize anything outside of yourself. And then some human beings get to the point where they want to be acknowledged as a god, as a deity, and they want power over the earth. This is the nature of human beings. Some people say that this world came about by chance, that it is only a random static phenomenon. Yet these planets that we see, they're not colliding. They're not conflicting with each other. They're swimming along in an orbit that has been set for them. Like our DNA, the DNA was discovered it was always there, but it was just discovered that every human being has a special map, a gene map that distinguishes them from someone else. And we used to be able to distinguish human beings by their ethnicity, by their color, by their stature, by their name. And then later on, we were able to distinguish human beings by their fingerprint. Now we can distinguish human beings by the retina. They call, they call that now inside your, inside your pass, passports now. They have something which they call, what do they call that now? It's new identification? What's it called? Yes. So we can, we can distinguish human beings now in lots of different micro ways. Why? Because this was already there, but we just discovered it. Think about the oceans and the fish and the insects and the birds and the plants and bacteria and the chemical elements that have not been discovered and cannot be detected even with the most sophisticated instruments. Yet each one of them has a law that they follow and we ask, did all of this happen by chance? And also, do these things function perpetually and perfectly also by chance? Do they keep on reproducing themselves and maintaining themselves also by chance? No, of course not. That would be totally, totally illogical and foolish to think of in the least. It would indicate that however they came to be, it is outside of the realm of human capability. We would all agree to that. It is our conclusion that, the, that a supreme being, an almighty power, God, our common creator, who has the knowledge to design and the knowledge to proportion, who has created all of this. And this is the source of our existence. That same creator, that same designer, has the authority to be responsible for maintaining all of this and is the only one that is deserving of our praise and our gratitude. This is why we must be grateful and mindful for all the gifts that we have been given to complement our lives. All of this is evident points towards an inescapable conclusion that this world and everything that it contains from the largest to the smallest, from the macro to the micro, from what is seen to what remains on the unseen, from what is known to what remains to be discovered is the result of intentional, complex, and a dynamic design. Since we can understand all of this, it is certainly beyond the scope and capability of humans who possess the greatest capacity and intelligence of all creatures, you see. Human beings possess the greatest capacity of intelligence 
of all creatures because human beings have intellect. That's what separates us from the animals. Excuse me, Mr. Darwin. For instance, if Mr. Darwin said, and all those who call themselves Darwinists said that human beings evolved from monkeys. Well, if that is so, then monkeys should still be evolving. And human beings should still be evolving. But monkeys is not evolving, and human beings is not evolving. For if monkeys was evolving, they would be still evolving to the point where humans would not be able to capture monkeys and put them in the zoo. I mean, by now, the monkeys should have found a key and know what to do. But the monkeys don't understand that they have been captured, and the monkeys do not understand that they're in the zoo, and the monkeys do not understand where is the key. Because, listen, if a gorilla, because you know monkeys is from the family of gorillas, right? Gorillas come from the monkeys, is that right? So if a gorilla escaped from the zoo, and kill four or five people before they captured the gorilla. When they captured the gorilla, would they prosecute the gorilla? No. Because they say that it's just an animal. And the animal doesn't possess intellect. And because the animal doesn't have intellect, it is not morally responsible. So who would we prosecute? we would prosecute the zookeeper because he or she was the one who was morally responsible to contain the gorilla. Is that correct? And that is why human beings are different from other animals. And if Mr. Darwin had understood that, he could have extricated himself from his foolish projection. He would have understood that there's a basic distinction between humans and apes. Even though humans, if they grow enough hair, they could look like apes. And when they dance to some of that monkey music, they look like apes. <laughs> and when they act in such ways that they do to each other, killing each other, they act like apes. Apes, human beings have the capacity, if they don't use their intellect, if they're not moral minded, they can subject themselves to act like apes, but apes cannot act like human beings. Because there's something about a human being, the human being has been given the gift of intellect. Since we can understand all of that, we know that the human intellect is what distinguishes us from all other animals. And what we must conclude is that this entire universe and what we refer to as our world, including human beings, are subordinate to a supreme and higher intelligence, which is the very source of our creation. Since we know that whatever human beings have developed manufactured or designed always comes with a manual of instruction. Isn't that correct? Uh, isn't that correct? <clears throat> so, uh, brothers and sisters, what, I'll just uh, 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 ad-lib here for a moment. The beauty of all of that is that we can see that the world that we are living in, whether if we want to go all the way, if we want to go 500 years uh, in the past, or if we want to project if we are able to 500 years towards the future, the development of human existence and the development of the products and services that we use to complement our lives is as a result of the intellect that we have been given. And that intellect is what distinguishes us from the small and the greater animals. And that intellect is what makes us 
responsible. And that intellect is what makes us moral or immoral. And that intellect is what you and I are going to be responsible for when we stand in front of our common judge and creator. And therefore, the purpose of life is for you and I to recognize, you know, the young boys singing that monkey music. That's what they say. They say that you better recognize. <laughs> See? So even in, in the course of their futility, still they're saying things that are significant for us to think about. So we human beings, we are responsible for what we do with our lives. You were given and we have been given a gift of life. And someone who gave us this gift will ask us about what we have been given. Our prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he said, take care of five things before five things. You see, take care of your life before your death. Take care of your time before you become, take care of your free time before you become busy. Take care of your wealth before your poverty. Take care of your health before your sickness. Take care of your youth before your old age. This is what our prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said. And because we humans have such superior faculties, that is why we are morally responsible for how we live our lives and how we interact with the, best, with the rest of the creation. Because of this moral responsibility, we have to be mindful. We have to take life seriously. And this is why we need to think about our future and what we want to achieve in our lives. This is why we need to develop a life plan to reasonably know at all times where we are and what we're doing. And just to show sometimes how human beings can become so preoccupied with either nostalgia or they can become preoccupied with so many things, complex things and endeavors, but they fail to take care of the thing that's the most important, their own life. So here we are at a university. We have faculty members here. We got students, we got administration. We got all kinds of people here. So I want to ask a question. How many people in this room, and be honest, how many people in this room have written for themselves a five-year or 10-year life plan that you make a reference to, that is you read it every month to see where you are, you assess yourself, you evaluate yourself to see where you are, and you make the adjustments, and then you're moving forward. How many people here can say that, that you have right now a life plan, five or 10 years that you can go back to and make a reference to? Raise your hand. You see? See? One or two. But these are all intelligent people who are moving towards sophisticated levels of responsibility in their life and in society, but they don't have a plan. And there's a simple formula that says, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. That's why there's a need for human beings to have inspiration in their life. That's why there's a need for human beings to be inspired by divine guidance. Because we can guide each other with a GPS that we made. And today, ain't nobody gonna buy no BMW. Nobody gonna buy no BMW. Nobody's gonna buy some fancy car. You got no GPS. You be telling us what? Say so the car costs the car costs sixty five thousand, but there's no GPS in it. You be like what? You gotta have a GPS. I mean, since the GPS came out, you've got to have it. 
You don't even know where you're going. It's around the corner. You got to put the GPS on. This is the indication of how dependent that human beings can become to things. So I want to say to you brothers and sisters here that no matter how old you are or how young you are, it is necessary for you and I to prepare a life plan and you're never too old to put yourself on the life plan track. And somebody, some people might be real smart and say, you know, I don't need no life plan, I know what I'm doing. So I'm gonna tell you what a life plan will do. A life plan will help you clarify your most important priorities. A life plan will enable you to maintain your balance. You will always know where, you always know where the, the, uh, where the guidelines are. You'll always know where the goal is at. A life plan will provide you a filter by which you can say no to lesser things. See, without a life plan, everything seems to feel good. Without a life plan, it don't make no difference who you lay down with. You can lay down with a gorilla. You know, people is making all kind of new type families today. New family, they call it nuclear families. You know, all families used to be like he, she. Now they make it he, he. And she, she. Used to be like Adam and Eve. Everybody understood Adam and Eve. Now it's Adam, it's Adam and Steve. You know, I, for me, I don't want to get into the moral question. You know, because today, if you start questioning the moral issues, all of a sudden you become like homophobic. They don't come up with some new word now. Homophobic, because you question the morality of issues. Okay, I say, look, forget it. 14 states have made it a law, all right. It's our country, you gotta follow the law, right? I don't have to do what they do, but I gotta recognize everybody have a right to do what they want to do. All right. So, you know, I'm thinking about this here. I'm thinking, okay, if Adam and Steve get married and Barbara and Betty get married, I'm wondering how they gonna get pregnant. Oh, I know. Adam and Steve, what they gonna do is they gonna take their sperm and they're going to give it to a girl. And she's going to become, what they call that? She's going to become a surrogate. So that means they give her like five grand or ten grand and make a contract with her, a civil contract. So she carries the baby of either Adam or Steve. And when the baby's born, they take the baby and give her the money and she can't have no rights to the baby no more. Now Adam and Steve is going to be like, they're going to be like, you know, they're a couple and they are a happy couple coming home from the hospital with their baby. But I wonder to myself, Adam and Steve is happy because they got their rights from the Constitution. But what about the rights of the baby? When the baby grows up, isn't it natural for a baby to ask or to look for their mother and father? If they're going to school with other children, what they say? I come to my house and visit my, my dad and dad. <laughs> and what about Betty and Barbara? How they gonna get pregnant? I mean, look, I'm not hating on nobody, so I don't want nobody to be saying the shake is hating. We just talking, right? This is the university, we can talk, it's America, right? Mr. Obama's in the White House, right? <laughs> so we just talking. So Barbara and Betty, they get pregnant. How they gonna get pregnant? Barbara and Betty ain't got no sperm. They might have a perm. <laughs> so how they gonna get pregnant? Oh yeah, I, I know. They gonna buy some sperm off the internet. 
And the mailman is going to deliver it. UPS or GPS going to deliver it. Then, you know, I don't have to get graphic, but y'all know what I'm saying. So they're going to inject it. So Barbara and Betty, one of them, going to get pregnant. And they're going to be happy. They're going to have a baby. But the issue is, when that baby is born, don't they have, don't the baby got rights? It should. When they go to school and they meet other children, what they gonna say? Come home and meet my mom and mom? And so when the little boy that Adam and Steve have and the little girl that Betty and Barbara have, when they meet each other, let's say their names is like Johnny and Jilly. That sounds silly. <laughs> so they meet each other. And maybe they like each other. But the lifestyle they come from, maybe their parents don't prefer that. So the parents tell Johnny that he need to meet Jackie. Johnny meet Jack. And Jilly, she meet Jane. And so if that projection continues for 20 generations, guess what it guarantees? It guarantees the annihilation of the human race. And I'm against the annihilation of the human, bait, of the human race. Therefore, I'm against anything that undermines the value and the existence of the human race. And I'm against the trivializing of the rights of the human beings that come about from those unnatural relationships. I'm against that. So I don't care, they can, make it, they can make it a law on the moon, I'm still against it. And that's why we need to have a life plan because a life plan will provide a filter by which we can say no to lesser things. A life plan will empower you to identify and address your current realities. A life plan will equip you to envision a better future. A life plan will serve as a road map for accomplishing what matters most. A life plan will help you to ensure that you don't finish life with regrets. Here in America, there was a man, his name was Vince Lombardi. How many people heard the name Vince Lombardi? Well, in case you didn't, you need to go home tonight and look up Vince Lombardi. He's called the winningest coach in football history. And Vince Lombardi, he said there's no other option but winning. Vince Lombardi took a team called the Green Bay Packers and built them into a winning machine. He won three Super Bowls in a row. It hadn't done before and hasn't been done after. But Vince Lombardi said if he had the same team, he would have won the Super Bowl four or five times because he built a winning machine. When they hit the field, they couldn't do anything but win. And those who opposed them, the opposite team, they lost before they came on the field because he instilled them with a life plan. Dear brothers and sisters, we must use all of the tools and all the instruments we have been given by Almighty God. Yet we must be aware at all times that life is short and we are responsible for our common creator, to our common creator, for what we have been given. That's part of the purpose of our lives, to recognize our creation. Each of us have the capacity to affect tremendous change within ourselves. And if we can balance and coordinate all of the elements that are within our grasp, each one of you tonight must also think about what you will do with your lives and with your God-given talents.
to enhance your personal life, your families, your societies, and inevitably how you will contribute to reforming our present world. Remember, each of us have the unique capacity to engineer and to innovate. Engineer and innovate. Now for us, we only engineer and innovate outside of the religion because the religion has already been formed. The moral core, the moral design, the value system for human beings have already been designed for us. But products and services that we use, we engineer and we innovate. And we give to our society and the world products and services which literally change the world, just as the greatest technological inventions of the 21st century. Um, <clears throat> I did a survey to find out what are the seven most profound life-changing technologies of the 21st century. The first one is the iPhone. The iPhone. And the average person that has an iPhone, and look, forget about these Androids. Look, the Androids came after the iPhone. Is that correct? Blackberry, Bluebird, whatever it is, they came after the iPhone. So it was the iPhone that changed communication between human beings. And the average person that has a smartphone, even if they're not such a smart person, the, their phone today rarely is outside of 10 feet of them for the rest of their life. They might lose their wife. They might lose their kids. But they don't know where their phone is at. <laughs> then they sit, brought the iPad. Then after that, now Google has just introduced a driverless car. They have tested the car in Tokyo. They've tested the car in New York City. They've tested the car in Beijing. They've tested the car in India. They've tested the car in 12 or 15 cities around the world. The car runs off of satellite instructions. The car recognizes what's on the side, the left and right, the front and the back. The car can sense slowing down. The car is operated from the satellite. And now, in two or three years, we'll call a taxi. It'll be a driverless taxi. It'll pull up outside. You'll get in the car and give the car instructions. You'll put your credit card inside and pay for the fare. The car will say, thank you very much, zoom, and drive you where you're going. <laughs> now, you laughing, but three, four, five years from now, we will be using this technology because it has already been developed. Then we have electric car charging stations that very soon the countries that are providing oil that is being consumed by automobiles. These countries, they need to be thinking because soon the world will not need their oil. And then YouTube has changed the world. They say every year in America alone, 80,000 divorces take place because of Facebook and YouTube. And then we already know that Facebook came about nine years ago. Nine years Facebook came. And within nine years, Facebook has more value than YouTube and Google. And just last week, I just read a young boy, American, who wasn't doing very well in high school. He created an application that Yahoo bought from him for $30 million. Can you imagine that? 
17-year-old high school student who wasn't doing very good in high school. He created an application that is able to facilitate people who want to get new stories, history, or whatever that's out there. He's created an application that can search for what you want and give you a paragraph to highlight it and tell you where you can get it from. And that application, Yahoo, bought it from him for $30 million. When they asked the young boy, what's he going to do with his money? He said, well, I'm going back to school. Thank you, brother. He said, I'm going back to school. <clears throat> but I already have another application that's better than the one that Yahoo bought from me. Can you imagine what technology has given to young people today? Dear brothers and sisters, no one could have imagined the far-reaching and profound effect that these inventions have had and will have upon our planet, yet they have been produced by the brain, the human mind, which indicates its potential. That is why we want you to stop and think about your purpose in life and how you can get the best out of your life and therefore live a purposeful life. To be successful in life, you need to follow the following rules. You need to know your objective. You need to be prepared. You need to have the proper training. You need to develop the proper resources. You need to make the regular assessment and you need to be able to compete. All of this will lead us to achievement. It will inevitably result in your becoming a leader. And this also means that you will carry a greater responsibility. So now the question is, how do you develop the correct system of life? We believe that Islam is a natural system of life, mandated and designed by Almighty God. For if human beings were to comply, and if human beings were to submit, the human beings would be able to digest adopt a system of life that will be the most correct for them throughout their lives. Now you don't have to accept that, but I would suggest that take an afternoon and do some introspection. Take an afternoon or a day and do a bit of research. Take an afternoon or a day and just read. And Islam has nothing to do with Arabs or Africans, or Asians. No, Africans, Arabs, and Asians became Muslims, many of them. But separate Muslims from Islam. Take Muslims out of the equation and just study about the system of Islam. And I believe the educated of you the moral of you, the intellectual of you. You will discover something in Islam that will complement your lives. And if you discover Islam and a system that will complement your life, you should know that it is applicable today as it was applicable yesterday. Islam as a system is the only system in the history of humanity that produced a civilization. No other system, no other religious system delivered to humanity a civilization. And if Islam delivered a civilization that brought humanity out of the dark ages into enlightenment, that's not nostalgia, that's not just history, that's a fact. If it did it that time, it will do it again. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so very much for listening to my proposition tonight. That's all it was, a proposition called the purpose of life. Those of you who can accept it and agree with that, the benefit is yours. Those who disagree, it's okay. We're living in a world where human beings, and thank God, we're living in a country 
But all human beings can differ. We can differ radically, but we can still tolerate and respect each other. So I hope that the non-Muslims here, uh, you will take my own subjective humor, cast it to the side, take my own subjective statements, conclusions, put them off to the side. But the principles and the values and the ethics which I propose to you, I suggest that you think about it. Do research about it and see how it might apply to your lives. And as for those of you who are Christians, well, you are our cousins. Muslims and Christians and Jews are cousins. We take our scriptures from the same God, different prophets, different formula, but the same monotheistic platform. So Muslims and Christians and Jews, we need to have a lot of interfaith discussions, interfaith collaboration, interfaith investment and commitment. Because at least Christians and Muslims and the Jewish people, at least we have the premise of monotheism. And the whole premise of Islam is built upon monotheism and prophetic paradigm. <clears throat> thank you very much. I want to thank the uh, Muslim Student Association of uh, this university for um, putting this lecture together. Uh, I want to thank their, um, uh, their student advisors. I want to thank the local masjids and their leaders for assisting these young people and inspiring them to do that. I want to thank all the non-Muslims who came, to, uh, the elders and the younger ones of them, who took the time to come out here and hear this uh, lecture. Um, I apologize if I stepped on anybody's toes, but I meant what I said. And maybe your shoes are just a little bit too long. Um, I thank Almighty God for the, um, uh, the blessings that he had bestowed upon us. I thank God for being an American citizen. Um, I travel around the world frequently. In fact, uh, probably twice a month I'm in a different country. Uh, and when I am in countries uh, that are restrictive of human rights, it makes me more appreciative to be an American. Uh, I thank Almighty God for the, uh, the opportunity to um, that he has given to us to have all this technology available for us. And uh, I would ask you, uh, just to tell you just a little bit, uh, I would ask each one of you to, uh, to go to uh, challengeyoursoul.com. That's our alternative to Facebook. Because we found too many of our young people spend a lot of time on Facebook doing some things and engage in some activities that are not so moral. So Facebook is good, but it's dangerous. So we created an alternative. It's called Challenge Your Soul. We also created a platform called Purpose TV, designed similar to the Discovery Channel. People can discover People can have introspection and they can have edutainment without graphic violence, without nudity, without profanity. A dignified television platform. We've developed a search engine. One of our colleagues in London, Mohammed Nashad, developed a search engine called El Wahi operates on the same platform as Google, but with Google, you can put in porn and you get 95 million options. Can you believe that? So Google has almost as much trash as it has treasure. So we developed a platform where you can't get that trash. Only treasure. It's called El Wahi. And lastly, 
Uh, just for the brothers and sisters who may know something about my life, I've written a book uh, over the last, I've been writing for about the last 25 years, and I just finished my book, it's under collection now, uh, and we're doing the movie on the book before we publish the book, we're doing a movie. The movie is called After X. The movie should be out this time next year. And anybody in the world that watched the movie Malcolm X, this movie called After X will be more profound than that. <laughs>